Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue this work that we've been doing uh, in understanding Daniel's last vision by looking at Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this morning for the people that are here and the time that we have together as we open up your word and we seek your spirit to teach us. We know, Lord, that um, you have been giving us light. Some of this is hard to bear. It goes against what we have thought and understood in the past. And um, we just ask, Lord, that we can uh, be open to what you have to teach us and that you can correct us and that error that may come in from the enemy uh, can be seen for what it is. We also know, Lord, that many people are searching for truth. We don't all have correct understanding of everything. And so we just ask that as we we seek to understand these things, that you can provide um, not just light to us, but ways to present this to others so that they can see this light as well. We ask for your spirit to be here now as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so um, somebody had sent me a, a message on one of the YouTube videos um, saying that we need to draw this on a line, which is what we are planning to do next week. Um, I've been trying to figure out how to do this. And, and what we're probably going to do is we're going to draw uh, Revelation 12. That is, we're going to take uh, the great red dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. We're going to put that on a line, uh, look at pagan Rome. Uh, then we'll do the same thing with uh, the papal beast of Revelation 13, the leopard-like beast. Um and also place uh, the two horn beast of Revelation 13 on the line. And then we will do that with Revelation 17. And then we'll try to see how these all fit together. And if any of this makes sense that we've been doing over the last few weeks. And, uh, um, you know, as, as we said many times, we're trying to look at everything and be no, as open as we can. Uh, we've noticed some things this week which uh, would support Colin's position in ways that we didn't expect, um, though we don't think it supports his conclusion. But basically the, the idea that uh, the presidents of the United States are represented in these seven kings. And uh, uh, so in a way that we I don't think he would have seen it. Uh, but I think that we can see now that this makes the most sense to interpret Revelation 17 that way. Now, what we're going to do here um, to finish off uh, this this week before we get into next week, where we're going to start drawing the lines, because I think we should be able to start doing that Sunday morning. And we'll probably take uh, probably take the whole week to finish off drawing the lines themselves. Uh, but what we're going to do is just read some more of Uriah Smith. And this this should just help us recognize the problems with his argument. The thing I like about reading Smith is he's very clear about what his argument is, but the fact that he writes in a polemical style, that is an, an argumentative style, um, that he often overstates his case and makes arguments that actually undo his case, but he uses rhetoric uh, to make you not realize that that's what he's doing. So he has weak arguments, and they're easy to see once you spend time looking at what he's saying. So we're going to read this, um, and just go through some of Uriah Smith's, probably the rest of this article uh, this morning. Okay, so he says, without sufficient thought, it is very easy to drop into the conclusion that the deadly wound of Revelation 13, verse 3 and 10, refers to the time and condition of the beast when it is said of it in Revelation 17, 8 and 11, that it is not. Now, now this is, I mean, this is a really interesting sentence or 
idea that he's presenting here. Because I don't see how else it could be seen any other way. Right? That this beast that receives a deadly wound, or the head that receives a deadly wound in the beast of Revelation 13, which is the papal beast, that that deadly wound happens in 1798. And, and he says that there is no time and condition of the beast when it is said of, in Revelation 17, 8, and 11 that it is not. Right? So he says, that cannot possibly be the case. The expression, it is not, denotes that the power, as a subject of prophecy, ceases to exist. Now, is there anything that, as a subject of prophecy, that ever ceases to exist? Right? I would say no. No. So, obviously, the deadly wound and the is not has to do with its role um, in some way in this progression of events, right? So the idea that the beast receives, a, one of the heads of the beast receives a deadly wound, and we know that that deadly wound is going to be healed, and that this is the papal head that receives that wound, that's that's how we understand it. It, it makes sense to say that it is not, is at a period in time in which that um that that beast or head is not it's not in the four right doesn't mean it doesn't exist right right or that it ceases to be a subject of prophecy i mean i'm not even sure where he where he just brings this in um and it definitely i, I don't see how it could apply to any beast or anything to say that it, it is not, that it's no longer a subject of prophecy. Well, if well, he said stuff, that, Okay. I'll just say all these, all these stuff moves through history. Yeah, it, it all moves through history. So we know that at some point the papacy loses its, its role, right? It, it no longer, it receives a deadly wound, but it's going to be resurrected at the end. And now maybe there's some other way in which we could understand it, because when we were looking at Revelation 17 yesterday and we were talking about uh, where it talks about the beast in Revelation 17, that it was and is not and shall. Um, uh, what's the word? Anyway, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Um. And we tried to say, well, is that the scarlet colored beast that the woman is riding? Now, if the scarlet colored beast is the kingdoms of this world, um, you know, not just in the present, but also throughout history, and that the, that the woman riding the scarlet colored beast does so from Rome, right, from the seven heads, which are... Uh, the seven hills or the seven mountains of Rome, then um, we can't say that the kingdoms of this world are, are never in a situation of they were and now they are not, right? But we could say this of the papal power. So this woman riding this beast, the woman is the papacy that is a church and she's fornicating with the state, right? And so the scarlet colored beast must represent the state. And, and part of that state is, of course, the city of Rome, which it did um, have during the 1260 years. And, and even before that, it was given the seat. But also um, in our time, we know that that's the role of the Catholic Church. Now, we could argue that the beast of Revelation 17 is just something in the past. That would be the preterist argument. But we know that this is something in the present. And we've tried to figure out how we can place that. So we can, we can say that this argument that it was not is somehow 
republicanism that is not um, during the time of imperialism and that it's going to be restored. That's uh, Bob Pickle's uh, view. It just it just doesn't track, right? So the best explanation is that the beast that was and is not is the papal beast of Revelation 13. And it becomes not when it receives the deadly wound in 1798. And so I don't see how you could escape this. But And, and this is the thing about Uriah Smith. It... it, it it is a when I say he's polemical, right? So he's he's using rhetoric and argument. So when he says without sufficient thought, it is very easy to drop into the conclusion that the deadly wound of Revelation 13, verse 3 and 10 refers to the time and condition of the beast when it is said of Revelation 17, 8 and 11 that it is not. But that cannot possibly be the case. So he puts this. That means you haven't given it any thought. If you take this position. Right. Which is the obvious position to take. But if you've taken it, you've just not given it any thought. Right. So you can see how he's trying to manipulate the reader. By his language. Right. See that, yeah. and, and, and this is the thing I don't like. I mean, I like it in the sense when I'm reading it, because I can see the type of way in which he's manipulating this information. And so it makes it really easy to, at least for me, to sort of see the weakness of his arguments because he, in a sense, he draws attention to them by how he tries to dis- to um, to hide them, right? You know, he tries to hide them in a sense in plain sight, his weakness of his arguments by how he does this. And so you can see this is, is a very weak argument because when somebody says that cannot possibly be the case and they've just stated the most obvious thing and they say, well, if you believe that, you haven't given it any thought. Um, but he's not going to show how it's not possibly the case. His argument here, the expression it is not denotes that a power as a subject of prophecy ceases to exist. Where would he get that conclusion that means that that's what that means? You know, like there is no connection to the idea. It is not means that a power as a subject of prophecy ceases to exist. He hasn't shown that and he's not going to show it. He's going to state it. Um, and so you can see right away he has this very weak argument because what he's just said that is obvious that we, sh- we would naturally fall into if we didn't think is actually the correct answer. Right. I mean, to me, I just don't see how we could see it any other way. It it just seems the most obvious conclusion. Um, So he says, um, but this could not be said of the experience in which it only receives a deadly wound. Which is healed before life becomes extinct. Now that again, we know that there's a time that it's not going to be. And that it will be, again, because it's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. So to me, a deadly wound, what what is a deadly wound? Would we say it's a mortal wound? You would think so. That's, That's another way of saying it. This head receives a mortal wound and it ceases to be, right? To all intents and purposes. To everybody's view. But... It's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Doesn't that describe what happened in 1798? Yes, but you can't have it both ways. Can you? You can't cease to exist and. Or am I wrong? Well, what he's saying is it can't refer to the papacy at all. That's what I'm saying. He can't have it both ways. Well, he, he, he doesn't want it the way that we want it. He wants it to refer to a form of government. Right, which is republicanism. Which is clearly a okay. confusing issue. So he says, looking over the whole history of Rome and considering that the Scarlet Beast of Revelation 17 takes in both the daily and the transgression of desolation of Daniel 8, we can see very, very clearly where the expression was not must come in. So what he's going to do is he's going to put the was not 
as the transition between paganism and papalism. So he's going to say the was not is because it's going to cease to exist. Paganism is going to cease to exist. But is paganism going to ascend out of a bottomless pit at the end of the world? Mm -hmm. Right? We know as Seventh-day Adventists, the thing that ascends out of the bottomless pit is the papacy. It's not republicanism in some kind of atheistic sense. Right? Now we know, so, so he's, he has this view that that this beast, this scarlet-colored beast, takes in both paganism and papacy, right? This the two desolating desolating powers. But we know that the woman riding the beast of Revelation 17 is the papacy. So this this argument about the scarlet colored beast the way that he's looking at it i mean one is it just doesn't it doesn't track I mean, we, it's going to create all kinds of problems but the obvious thing that we see is the thing that he tells us we can't accept that the deadly wound has something to do with the beast not being so he'll he'll put the deadly wound as the papacy in 1798, but he won't take that the beast that was and is not as being as being connected to that. But there's no reason to take that position. And then he's going to create this view of the beast, the scarlet colored beast, that it's it's the two desolating powers. But Anyway, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand his view, and, and maybe I don't understand it, but let's go on and read and see what he says. So, uh, okay, so I'll just go back, read this sentence again. Looking over the whole history of Rome and considering the scarlet beast of Revelation, scarlet beast of Revelation 17 takes in both the daily and the transgression of desolation of Daniel 8, we can very clearly we can see very clearly where the expression was not. Um, actually, I think the expression is not, uh, must come in. It was in the transition from paganism to the papacy when the daily paganism was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and the beast under its pagan form as a persecuting power ceased to exist. The beast for a time was not. Um, but under a new form, after some two centuries or more, it reappeared as the papacy and the per persecution began again. There was an end of one form of the beast, and it was not, till it assumed another form. This meets completely the end of the prophecy, but as already remarked, the wounding of one of the heads um, would not by any means meet said conditions. In the case of the wounding of the head, the life of the beast is recognized as continuing right along. For the prophecy, after saying that he had wound by a sword, does not say that he died, but that he had a wound by a sword and did live. Okay, so, but this is a deadly wound or a mortal wound, right? And we know that the papacy did live but it appeared not to be able to live, right? Now, part of the thing is because he's stuck in the idea that these are seven forms of Roman government. And if we took, so one of the things you have to do, if you're going to argue against somebody's view, you actually have to argue against their view. Does that make sense? That is, you can't argue against something they are not saying or something or make an argument against what someone's saying. When, if you considered what they're saying, that that argument wouldn't, wouldn't be valid. So if we believe that the seven heads in the beast of Revelation 13 are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, the United States, and the UN, we know that the beast itself represents the papacy. It's this composite beast. 
leopard, bear, lion, right? Okay. And, and this has a mouth speaking great things. So it, it's got the, the aspect of, of Rome, right? The dragon, the dragon power. So it has this dragon power, right? It's, it's a continuation of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So to have one of those heads as being part of that beast um, or having those heads as being those kingdoms makes complete sense. But when the deadly wound happens, it happens to one of the heads. Obviously, the beast isn't going to die. It's going to still live, even though one of the heads is wounded. Right? It receives a mortal wound. So you can see, just because you kill one of the heads of a seven-headed beast, does that beast cease to exist? It's now another head of that beast is going to continue. And that head is going to be the one that is the United States. And the second beast of Revelation 13 is going to be a beast that represents the United States. Because it's going to rise in 1798 when the deadly wound is given to the papacy. But it's still part of that system because even though it has horns like a lamb it's going to speak like a drag right so so you can see that when when uriah smith in his polemical style creates these arguments these positions against something he's not trying to convince the person that he's arguing against or who holds that view he is trying to convince the people who might buy into this other view that, that Uriah Smith doesn't hold. And so he's just going to paint a picture of whatever somebody believes in, in a way that makes it look absurd. But he's not actually examining what is being presented. He's not, he's not openly considering, okay, Maybe there's something to what they're saying. Let's look at the whole argument and let's let's examine it and see if it holds water. And maybe there's something we can learn here. Uriah Smith never does that. In, in anything I've read of his, and I've read a lot of his material, he always comes from the point that whatever view he doesn't hold is is absurd. And sometimes he's right. Sometimes they are absurd ideas that he's arguing against. But, but he's never allowing himself to see something that he, he hasn't seen before. He's, he's dug in to a view and, and not uh, be corrected. What's that? That seems common today with people, you know, with us and people. Well, yeah, it's, it's part of human nature. But yeah. if, if we are wrong, it's better to be corrected than to continue to be wrong. Right. And I understand the idea of, you know, this is some truth that we have, you know, because God has given us this truth. But we know that God also gives us new light. And, and we can't believe that, you know, the pioneer understanding was complete because there's so many things that they couldn't have seen that we now can see. So we constantly have to go back and examine and see, we know they were right, we know the foundation was laid correctly, and we've seen that, we've examined it. But we know that there are details and things that they couldn't possibly have seen. And, and so in, in this study, we've seen, well, this makes sense when you're talking about the beast of Revelation 12, that it's the forms of Roman government, that, that that would make sense for the pagan pagan Rome. But it doesn't make sense for the beast of Revelation 13. And it definitely doesn't make sense to have all of the heads be the same thing for each of these beasts. They're symbols. And symbols can have more than one meanings. And you have to consider the context of that. So when you have a woman riding a beast and she sits upon this beast, 
that has seven heads and it says those seven heads are seven mountains, well, we would say makes much more sense in Revelation 17 to take the seven heads to represent the city of Rome. That's where the woman sits. But it doesn't it wouldn't make sense to do that for Revelation 13 or for Revelation 12, even though the city of Rome is is still, in a sense, in all of those visions. It makes much more sense to take um, those heads as representing different things in each, each of the beasts, because in one you have the heads with crowns. One, you have the heads with names of blasphemy. The other one, the heads are mountains upon which the woman sits. So in each one of these, these different interpretations that people have had of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. The, the problem is, is that people have tried to take this beast as always being the same symbols. But we can see that at different times, those heads are going to represent different things. The horns are going to represent different things. Because the beasts aren't the same. They have characteristics that are the same. That, that help us tie them all together in this progression. But it, it wouldn't make sense to, to do what we've always done, which until this week, we always did, or at least the last couple of weeks, that we always said that they're the same. And so, so we've conceded they're not the same. The heads are not the same. They're, they're a symbol, but they mean different things in different beasts because the beasts aren't the same. And that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> but he received a wound which, if it had not been healed, would soon have resulted in death. Right. So, so going back here. So he says it is most infelish, infelish, I don't know what that word. It's most unhappy to, to say, as some do that the papacy was wounded by the Reformation in the sense of this prophecy, though not complete till its overthrow in 1798. For that was simply the earth opening her mouth and swallowing up the flood sent out to destroy the church. So again, he, he kind of mixes these two together. Um, obviously, the deadly wound does not happen until 1798. But, but the wounding brought to view in the prophecy is a violent attack with carnal weapons. It is by the sword. Now, when it says it is by the sword, is that carnal weapons? I mean, that's what he's saying. What does it mean it received a wound by the sword but did live? Would we say that, that that's referring just to carnal weapons? It's referring to the word of God. Okay, right. So we can see that this is actually the word of God that brings an end to the papacy, right? Through prophecy. That this isn't about weapons. That this is about God's word, about prophecy. So it received a wound by the sword. So we know that it comes to an end in 1798, based upon the 2520, the 2260s, right? So he says, I hope many have not departed from the view generally held among us that the deadly wound was afflicted in 1798. And what then was done? The papacy was for the time being abolished. Rome was uh, erected into a, a republic. The Pope was carried away into exile and died there. And the College of Cardinals was scattered and the whole papal machinery was thrown out of, out of gear. It was a deadly wound. That is, had it continued for any great length of time, the papacy would, by that calamity, have then and there become defunct. But in 1800, a new demand arose for the influence of the papacy. Its sanction was wanted for the coronation of the elder Bonaparte, not the sanction of the dead, but of the living power. The scattered cardinals were called together. Another pope was elected, and the whole papal machinery was again put into operation. The wound was healed. So he's going to have the wound healed in 18. 100 and would we say that that the wound was healed because what what was the deadly wound what did it accomplish well the um to open up the book of daniel a little okay. bit. 
but I mean just to the papacy itself, to its role. Do, would we say that the papacy was now reinstated in 1800, that its role was healed of what happened with the deadly wound? I mean... Yeah, so secularism was really what occurred to uh, bring that wound. Yeah, so it... Yeah, so it's it's deadly wound can't be said to have been healed in eighteen hundred. So he says the Pope resumed his position of influence among the rulers of Europe, and that system of error, superstition, and opposition to God and his truth in the earth was gone on, has gone on from this that day to this. The effect of the wound is seen in the restraint of the open and boasted persecution formerly inflicted, but does not any, but does anyone doubt that the papacy is the same draconic power as formerly? Of course it is, but is its influence, is its role, is its function, is its power uh, taken away in 1798? And does it restore that in, in, in 1800? No, no. So, I mean, it it definitely has lost had lost its place. Now, it it, it was gradually doing so, but definitely in 1798, that's the deadly wound, and and he agrees. But you can't say that the wound was healed in 1800. I mean, most people aren't going to put it until the Lateran Treaty at at the at the earliest. Now the papacy is still there, right? So, so he's saying that you can't say that it was and is not, and yet is. But we can say that that's what happens when it receives the deadly wound. It is not, but yet it is. It still exists, and it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, right? That's that's still future. So there's nothing about either the deadly wound or what it says about the beast that was and is not and yet is, that would be in conflict with each other. They would be in agreement. So we can say that the deadly wound and it being not and yet is are exactly the same thing. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to skip a bit there and go here. It says the papal power was symbolized in prophecy before it received power and authority from the emperor of the East, which marked the beginning of the 1260 60 years. So we know that the papal power, it's symbolized in prophecy before it received power and authority from the emperor of the East, right? So that's going to be in 538. Hence, it is not necessary that a new decree should be issued by any earthly government declaring the Pope to be the head of all the churches to constitute the papacy the beast of Revelation 13 and 17, or to heal the deadly wound any more than it is already healed. Now, does that make sense? Shouldn't it actually have to be placed upon the throne of the earth in order for the deadly wound to be healed? He's saying that it, there's nothing more that could be done that would constitute the healing of the deadly wound that's already happened. Would we agree with that? I would disagree. Yeah. So we know that it's just in, in the how it got set up on the throne of the earth at the beginning, at the beginning of the 1260, the same sort of thing has to occur at the end. Just because the popes get together and, and keep their organization running, the Catholic Church running, um, the pope is in a much weakened condition. The papacy is in a weakened condition. It's no longer in control of the kingdoms of the earth. And, but it's going to become in control of the kingdoms of the earth at the end of the world. And that is, the whole world will wander after the beast again. Right? So, so it's just kind of How, you know, I mean, I can see maybe to some point on how Uriah Smith sees it in his time, but 
But I don't see it based upon what Ellen White has said about this. He says, but more than this, if the deadly wound is not yet healed, we have anticipated the prophecy in regard to the two horned horned beasts. For the very first actions of the two horned beast are done in the sight of the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. For that point is especially noted. Um, so what he's trying to say here, we know that um, the two horned beast, the United States, it's going to have horns like a lamb, but it's going to speak as a dragon. And it's going to cause the whole world to worship the beast in his image. It's going to make an image to the beast. And, and that really contradicts everything that he's just said about, because we would know that when that, the, the beast, the image to the beast is made, and it's going to say worship the beast and his image, when that's done, that's exactly the thing that would refer to the healing of the deadly wound. Now, because he doesn't hold the view that the different heads of this beast are the different kingdoms of prophecy, and he doesn't place the United States as one of those heads, that is, uh, it's going to be the seventh head, right? Uh, or pardon me, the, the sixth head, right? And then the seventh head is something else, So, which would be the UN. So since he doesn't have that view, he could look at it in this way. But in order to make this argument, he needs to consider this other view. Now, of course, he doesn't have a view where the United States is uh, uh, the sixth head, right? So in some of the views at that time, people were talking about uh, uh, different things as being the sixth head. Oh, pardon me. So five or fallen one is. So the seventh head is the United States, right? Five are fallen. That's the papacy. One is, is the sixth. That's the United States. Okay, pardon me. And then the seventh head is the UN. That's what we say. Okay. I'm getting, I'm getting confused. Um, but the point is that view doesn't, isn't, uh, isn't stated back in his time. But there still are views that have um, the United States as one of the heads in some way or other. At least these are things that are going to happen in the future. And he's not considering any of that. He's just always considering that the seventh head is, is the papacy. But if you looked, and, and that's true, if the seven head is the papal form of Roman government and it receives a deadly wound, that would be the end of the beast, right? But if it's only the sixth head, or the fifth head, we see five are fallen. Yeah, the fifth head that receives the deadly wound. That beast then is, and their progression of kingdoms, then you would know that the beast, even though it received this deadly wound, it doesn't cease to exist, right? So he's not considering that argument. So, so he goes on here. He says... Um, Let's read this again. But more of it than this, if the deadly wound is not yet healed, we have anticipated the prophecy in regard to the two horned beast. For the very first actions of the two horned beast are done in the sight of the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. For that point is especially noted. Now, if the deadly wound is not yet healed, the two horned beast has not yet done anything in the fulfillment of the prophecy which would be about as absurd as to say that the wound is not yet healed. Okay, so you understand what he's saying here. Does anybody understand this argument? It's, it's kind of an odd one, but you know, I, I don't mean to be polemical in that sense. Um, so if we look at Revelation 13, so let's see what he's, he's actually trying to say here. So you got the first beast, right? You're going to have the deadly wound. It's got the most speaking great things. And then the second beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. 
and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. So when does he do this in the sight of the beast? Is that in 1798? Isn't all of these things that happen in the sight of the beast when the deadly wound is healed? Right? So he's just trying to say, well, if if the deadly wound hasn't been healed, how could this two-horned beast do this in the sight of the beast? But this is actually at the time of the Sunday law, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah, so it's bringing us to the time when this lamb speaks as a dragon. Then it's going to do that in the sight of the beast. At that point, the deadly wound is healed. Now, this second beast is also one of the hands. Because the United States, even though it's one of the heads of this beast of Revelation 13, the reason why it is, is because it is going to do this, right? That is, the papacy, these different heads represent the different characteristics of the papacy. It has the characteristics of Babylon. It has the characteristics of Medo-Persia. It has the characteristics of Greece. It has the characteristics of pagan Rome. It obviously has the characteristics of papal Rome, since it's the papal beast. But the United States becomes the sixth head. It, it is the sixth head, but it becomes that because of what it's going to do. This second beast is another beast. It's another nation. It's another kingdom. And it's similar to me to Persia in that it's two horned, like a lamb, like a ram. But it's going to have the mouth of a dragon. It's going to speak for the papacy. It's going to heal the deadly wound. Right? It's going to cause the whole world the whole earth, and then the dweller therein to worship the first beast, the papal beast, because it's one of the heads of that beast. And this makes sense where you can have something separate, but also be a head. So it's just describing in detail this kingdom, which is really just part of this beast. It's one of the heads, but it stands as a separate, separate time, a separate nation, in this period, which we call uh, the, the days of one king, the 70 years, the days of one king. So, so it definitely makes much more sense uh, to take the position that this movement has taken and that many Adventists have taken, um, that the deadly wound is when the beast is not, and yet is, right? And it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's going to be at this time in which the two-horned beast is going to speak like a dragon. And so it's going to describe that. So he has two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. He doesn't speak as a dragon right from 1798. He's not speaking like a dragon in 1840. You know, or even 1900. Right, 1926, the start of it, I think. I would think. Well, well, the United, yeah. So the United States itself, as far as its league with Rome, that's going to be Reagan. You know, we right. can't even put a league with Rome. You know, with uh, JFK. I mean, JFK is is a Catholic, but he's not acting. Um, 
you know, he, he's probably a precursor to what the Catholic Church wants to do, at least in. But you see, you know, the whole idea that even a Catholic becomes a president, um, that's a pretty difficult thing in the United States. You can see for Uriah Smith and many people in the, in the time of Ellen White, the idea that the United States is is going to cause people to worship the Catholic Church again um, just seems absurd. The United States is the bastion of freedom. It's, it's a Protestant nation. It'll never become a Catholic nation. Um, that's the, the way people thought of it. And so that's why a big deal was made when we had a Catholic president for the first time. It's like, how did that happen? Well, you know, he's a Catholic, but he's not really. I mean, uh, but he is, right? But when we get to Reagan, who's a Protestant president, and he makes a league with Rome, that becomes a much bigger deal prophetically, right? That's the beginning of the healing of the deadly wound, as far as I'm concerned, not, not necessarily even the Lateran Treaty, because, I mean, that, that affects the world. But it's when Reagan makes that league that we can then start talking about those seven kings in Revelation 17, starting with Reagan. And, and then try to figure out, you know, how, how we would place those. And we're going to do those on a line next week, hopefully. <clears throat> but you can see here that, that his argument is, again, it's a weak argument because he's not, he's not considering everything. So this, this is a problem that I see with, with how he's arguing. So, but that's what he's trying to refer to. Uh, what of uh, the, the national reform, like uh, 1888 How How can we mark that one? Because I see that uh, it's more like uh, they're making the image to the beast because uh, they want to, 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 to reform the nation. And uh, A.T. Jones speaks like uh, national reform that is um, to do with it. So me, I'm seeing it like that's when it started, but that's uh, progression. Right. So, so we see what happens. So what you're referring to is, is 1888, 1892. Number of studies on. Okay. So we did those studies um, on Friday nights. And there definitely is a parallel that's happening in that history to our history. That is, A.T. Jones sees in 1892 that um, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, right? So in that history, we see all of these events that are typifying what's going to happen in the future. But they never materialize into what Jones has seen that is going to happen. And Ellen White sees that, that too. She sees that we're on, on the border of these events right she agrees with jones but yet all of those things fizzle out and they fizzle out because god's people have not accepted the message of righteousness by faith that is going to allow them to go through that time and so we have a parallel in our history we go through the same thing but we can learn from the past because christ is not going to return if he does not have a people that he can then represent that can then represent his character to the world. Until that happens, Christ cannot come back. But all of that was done as a type for us, because we know the first and second angels' messages were rejected. So the third could not do its power. It had no power in and of itself without the first and second. So so yes, these things, the deadly wound was in the point of being healed. But still, if you look at it overall in that time, the United States, even though the Protestants are starting to create this image to the beast, there's still so much hatred towards the Catholic Church, even though that they're starting to become like the Catholic Church, because they become part of Babylon, you know, in the 1840s, and they begin on this course to actually make the image to the beast, that's still going to be something later, which is happening in our time. 
So we're going to have the Sunday law, the image to the beast and the Sunday law in our time. But the point that he's making here is he's saying, well, that deadly wound must have already been healed in 1800. In order for it to be said about this two horned beast that he's doing these things in the sight of the beast. And yet what it's talking about is the Sunday law. Which, of course, that is the healing of the deadly wound, right? When this image of the beast is made and the Sunday law happens. So to talk about the deadly wound being healed, he, he's just saying, oh, they received this wound 1798, but it didn't really cause them to die. But it's a deadly wound. It's a mortal wound. And he just says, well, you know, if they wouldn't have organized the cardinals. I mean, just because the Pope's taken captive, the whole Catholic Church as a structure is not going to disappear, right? I mean, it's very wealthy institution. What, what disappeared was the influence that the Catholic Church had. It didn't have that influence over Europe. It, and, and in a sense that it already waned, but this deadly wound is a prophetic marker which is marked by a sword that is the word of God. Well, it's just lost its monarchy. Yeah. And, but it's the word of God. It's, it's the end of the 1260. That's the wound that it received by a sword. So, so now, obviously he's using words like absurd, you know, things like that. And that's part of his polemical thing. But, it's absurd to use the word absurd. So I'm being he absurd in doing that. It. It's, yeah, it's just, you need to understand what someone else is saying. And, and when you can't do that, when you're going to really present an argument that's, that's weak, that's only truly when something can be absurd, right? Just because somebody believes something that's wrong doesn't make it absurd. And, and you need to understand their argument. People do make absurd arguments, but there's nothing absurd about the argument that we have made because we're taking into consideration things that he's not. Yes, if we weren't considering, if we were seeing everything the way that he saw it and we drew this conclusion, well, that would be absurd. That means that we, is it wouldn't logically track from the information. But what we're, we're doing is we're looking at this logically. There's no absurdity about the idea that the deadly wound is when the beast is not. That's not absurd, right? And so to use that word in the way that he's using it all the time, um, that's just polemics. It's just rhetoric. It's, it's basically he's browbeating you a bit, right? And, and hopefully you don't uh, accept this absurd idea. You're going to accept his view. And that's not the way that we argue. That's not the way that we study or discuss things. So, but a beast that can survive a deadly wound for a century has certainly enormous vitality. Should it, however, now remember, it's one of the heads that received a deadly wound, right? Not the, the beast itself is still alive. The deadly wound is the papacy. The head that is following is the sixth head. So the fifth head receives the deadly wound. That's the papacy. The sixth head is the United States, but it's still a head of this power, right? Okay. Should it, however, and that's because it's going to be the one that causes the deadly wound to be healed, right? So should it, however, be said that the deadly wound was not given till 1870, then we destroy entirely the application of the prophecy of the 1260 years. So nobody takes that view, though, at least of us. And even then, the beast has been getting along very comfortably with the deadly wound for more than a quarter of a century and yet lives with the prospect of continuing in just as good circumstances while time shall last. And this has been the most active and in some respects, the most prosperous period of its existence. And I think he chooses 1870 because isn't that having to do with the Vatican Council. I'm not sure why he talks about 1870 or why anybody would. 
Um, so anyway, um, for this made to cover, this made made, this is made to cover the time when the beast was not. That since the deadly wound was given, whether 1798 or 1870, there has been no papis, papacy in the world. But remember, it says it was not, is not, but yet is. Okay, so it doesn't cease to exist. But an ecclesiastical organization which controls the countries that the Catholic Church controls, which holds the balance of power in large portions of our own country, which appropriates millions of funds of some of our city treasuries to its own use and dictates the policy of our great national political parties, as it just as it has just dictated to the Republican Party in 1896, is certainly a very lively and powerful corpse. And to say under these circumstances that the papacy does not exist is, with all due respect to those who have persuaded themselves in that belief, the climax of absurd absurdity. So it's not just absurd, it's the climax of absurdity. But nobody is saying that the papacy does not exist, right? Right, no, nobody's saying, I don't even think in his day, Nobody's saying the papacy does not exist. So what he's saying is, if you say it received a deadly wound, you must say it doesn't exist. But that's not what anybody's saying about the papacy receiving a deadly wound. Nobody's arguing for its non-existence. But he's saying, well, if you say it received a deadly wound in 1798 and it wasn't healed, then you're arguing for its non-existence. Right. So he still wants to have the deadly wound there, but he doesn't want... You know, he just wants it to be healed sooner. Right. So he's going to put the beast that was and is not as as dealing with all of the both desolating powers. And he's going to have that period for whenever pagan Rome falls, whatever he's going to decide that is. And until when the papacy arises as the time when it is not. But again, if you take that from John's day. That's not really true. Just because you, you don't have a republic of Rome, you still have Rome. Rome did not cease to exist just because it became an empire. Right? So, so you could use the same arguments that he's using here against his own idea. So the only thing that we could say that um, that was and is not and yet is and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, the only place that we could apply that that's consistent, that doesn't have any contradictions, would be to the papacy in 1798 until the Sunday law. Okay. <clears throat> So hopefully that, that all made sense. Okay, there's another point on which it is supposed that a difficulty exists, but in reference to which it will be necessary to say but a few words. The point is concerning the exarchate of Ravenna. In the scheme here advocated, the exarchate of Ravenna comes in after the imperial form of government as the seventh head. This form of government ruled Rome some 60 years, but the prophecy says of it according to the common version, it was to continue but a short space. So, um, so he's going. This is this is a whole other argument dealing with the different um, uh, forms of Roman government. So some people say, well, that's going to be the seventh head, not the papal form. Right. So he's he's going to be arguing about that. So he's going to uh, true the time of the continuance. Okay. Now it is asked, how can the sixty years of the exarchate be called a short space when the decimivers continue less than two years and dictators not more, usually than six months at a time. True, the time of the continuance of the decimivers and of the individual dictators or the individual triumvirates was shorter than the 60 years of the execute. But it ought not to be necessary to remind the reader that the prophet is not drawing any comparison uh, between the heads as to the time of their continuance previous to his time. If the prophet had occasion to speak of the relative duration of all the heads, 
he doubtless would have called those named very short, but he makes no allusion whatever to them. Anyway, this is kind of a relevant argument to what we're talking about. Um, and we're going to look in detail. When we draw a pagan Rome, we're going to look at these different forms of Roman government and, and see if we can thoroughly make sense of it, if we can list them and when they occurred and put them on a line. Um, okay. So he's arguing more about the different types of heads as far as the forms of Roman government. Okay. Um, okay, so he says some other features of one of the new views proposed demand a word of notice as they seem so utterly untenable, um, that is unsupportable. The seventh head is to appear in the coming state of anarchy in Europe when the existing governments will break up into chaos and the present ten horns will cease to exist and disappear then the Pope assumes the role of pacificator. All is submitted to him, and he divides Europe into 10 new provinces, which constitute the 10 horns of the beast of Revelation 17, 12. So there's some view that's happening in Uriah Smith's day where they're trying to reinterpret uh, these heads. Now, one of the things that has to be said about this is that there definitely is a multitude of different interpretations that are occurring in Uriah Smith's day. And what he's trying to do is he's being conservative. He's saying, what God gave us in the past is correct. I'm going to support it. And any of these new views that come along, I'm going to show the problems with them. Now, the thing is, there is problems with these views, right? People are making speculation. And now it could be that Uriah Smith is looking at the strongest points of these arguments, but mostly what he tries to do is, is pick at flaws with any of these views. Instead of considering that there might be some, some way in which these heads could be understood differently. So we can see that this view that uh, somehow Europe is going to be into chaos, and we know that that's going to occur. But they're, they're going to break up into chaos and the ten horns cease to exist. And then the Pope comes and divides Europe into ten new provinces. Well, obviously, that's not what happened. And that's not what we're looking for. Um, because, But he's just saying that these ten horns can't represent anything other than the ten nations um, that conquered the Roman Empire. But we can see that these ten horns as a symbol can represent the United Nations. So the Pope doesn't come in and divide up the world into 10 parts. Though some people think that that's what has to happen. But just as a symbol, we can see that the United Nations uh, is going to constitute those 10 horns. So he says, this makes these horns still future and entirely different from the 10 horns of Revelation 13, verse one. But does the prophecy give any intimation that a new set of 10 horns is to arise? Not a syllable. syllable. Besides, this conjecture is directly contrary to the prophecy of Daniel. All must agree that the kings mentioned in Daniel 2, 44, are the original 10 kingdoms that arose out of the old Roman Empire. But these kingdoms, which can be so clearly traced in Europe today, exist to the end, for it is in the days of these kings, not a new set, that the God of heaven sets up his kingdom. Then these kingdoms cannot lose their identity, cease to exist, and a new set arise as this scheme proposed before Christ comes. In Daniel 7, verse 7 to 11, there's no intimation that a new set of just 10 horns uh, takes the place of the first that rose out of Rome before the beast goes into the burning flame. Or do these 10 horns refer not to the past divisions of Rome, but only to the future 10 horns? And is there another little horn to arise among them? And have our past expositions of this prophecy been all wrong? So you can see that he's trying to defend our past understanding of things. And, um, but how do we answer this, this objection? We, we've already answered it, but, but how, how do we answer this? What is the problem? What is it that he's, he's missing?
are the horns in the beast of Revelation 12 the same as the horns in the beast of Revelation 13? Is there a difference between the horns? Because he says it's not even intimated, right? But is it intimated that there's a difference well, you, between the horns? Yeah, you have the crowns in chapter 13. Right. Uh, hinted at. Um, so, yeah, so you have crowns on the horns in chapter 13, but you don't have crowns on the horns in chapter 12. And, of course, we know that's pagan Rome. So, so we still haven't really fully addressed what the horns are in chapter 12, and we're going to try to address that next week. But, um, but the horns, because the beasts are different, uh, all we can do with, with Daniel chapter 2, for instance, we know that, that those 10 toes represent the division of the world at the end, right? As a symbol. That it, it's not saying that those 10 toes are the 10 divisions of Rome, right? You have, yeah, sort of you, have, you have Paul saying that the gospel went to the whole world. Yeah. And that's generally implied the, the whole Roman world. Mm -hmm. So you have that ten symbol symbolizing the world. Yes. So yes, maybe so rather, rather than maybe looking at specific emperors or something, it's just like a symbol of the world, known world at that particular time. Exactly. So it, it's a symbol of the world. At, so the whole world is going to have this stone smite the feet of that image, right? That is, it's not some localized event. It's worldwide. But remember, in, in Daniel chapter 2, when we looked at it, one of the problems that, uh, that Jeff had in his paper, which we saw in Parminder, is trying to read into the details of Daniel chapter 2 what is only detailed in later prophecies. That is, Daniel chapter 2 isn't giving us all this specification. So if we always say, well, the ten toes are the ten horns, and the ten horns are always the same thing, then they always have to be Europe, the divisions of Europe. But we know at the end that it's the whole world. So, yes, the divisions of the Roman Empire into ten symbolizes the world. So in Daniel chapter 7, the focus there is upon um, these kingdoms, and there's going to be these ten horns. That's going to be Rome. That's going to be uh, – and, and it doesn't distinguish um, – because let's go there. So let's understand clearly what we're talking about. <clears throat> so in uh, Daniel chapter 7, we're going to have these beasts. And there's just four beasts, right? There isn't seven beasts or eight beasts or anything like that. Um, and then we're going to have these horns, right? So in verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So you're going to have these uh, ten horns, and he's going to see a little horn. So those ten horns have to be those those horns that is the division of pagan Rome. It's going to be divided by these Germanic tribes coming in. And then this little horn is going to pluck up three of those horns, right? That's the papacy. Those are the, uh, those three obstacles that it has to overcome. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. So then we're going to be brought to the judgment, right? Fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Right. And we're going to know that this brings us to the beginning of the judgment. Right. That's going to be 1844. Right? Um, he says he sees the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. 
And there was given him dominion, glory, kingdom, and all the people of the nation and language shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So even here, it's not differentiating all of the details of, of the end time events. It's going to bring us to the time of the papacy, and it's going to bring us to the time of the judgment. It's going to show the time of the judgment. The son has given his dominion. So that begins in 1844, right? Now, we know, of course, there's more details to be added later in different visions about that period of time. But you can't read into this here all of the details. They're not there. Um, and then, you know, then he's going to have the explanation, right? So he has the vision, and now he's going to be given the interpretation. So the great beasts, which are four, this is verse 17, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. We know that these are kingdoms, right? But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamp the residue with his feet. So this is the papal power that treads underfoot the holy city 40 and two months. And of the ten horns uh, that thou that were in his head, and of the other which came up before, whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. So we can see that this is referring to Rome is the final kingdom. It's going to come all, all the way to the end. But there, there is that this fourth beast, these ten horns. There's one of these are ten kings. So this is a progression in a sense of of Rome, but this little horn is going to subdue three kings. And then it says, he shall speak word, great words against the most high, shall think to wear, shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hands until a time, times and a dividing of times till 1798. But the judgment shall sit, 1844, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion of the greatness of the kingdom un under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is of an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Right. So, again, there isn't this fine detail in what happens at the end. We know that the papacy is part of Rome. Right. It's going to to come out of Rome, pagan Rome. And it's going to continue for time, times, and a dividing of times, 1260 years. And then the judgment is going to sit. Right? And, and in that, his dominion will consume. So he's going to be taken completely. His kingdom is going to be destroyed. And this new kingdom is going to be God's kingdom. But again, it doesn't give us all this detail. And so we can't read back into this and try to find that detail that doesn't exist in the prophecy itself. Other prophecies are given that are going to give us more detail. But we know that this beasts in Daniel 7 are the basis for the beasts in Revelation uh, 12, 13 and 17. Right. <clears throat> So if we go back to what he's saying, um,
So we can see that the details here in Daniel chapter 7, dealing with these kings, you can't just argue that these are then always the same divisions, always the same ten horns that you see in in either you know Revelation 12, 13, or 17. There's no reason to assume they're the same horns. But they have a symbol of something which represents the whole world. Right? So we know in, in Daniel chapter 7 that it's going to talk about this 10 divisions of Rome and that those three horns that are plucked up are those three, three of those divisions that then uh, place Rome are connected to placing Rome upon the throne of the earth. They need to subdue three of those horns. But the fact that those three horns are gone, that there isn't 10 anymore, how do we address that? Because do we have the 10 if three of them are plucked up? Well, we don't, but it's still it's considering them still as 10. Right. So just like the 70 um, uh, sons of uh, of Gideon, Abimelech. Is it Abimelech? No, uh, not Abimelech. The 70 sons of Gideon. Yeah, Gideon, what's his, uh, Jer Jerobeel? Yes. Right? Okay. Right. So 70, there are 70 sons, but it always says 70 were killed, even though 69 were killed, right? So, so we can see that. So that means it stands as a symbol. It doesn't need to be understood literally at the end of the world, right? We don't need the world divided into 10 parts in order for those to be the United Nations, symbolizing the United Nations. The United Nations is symbolized by the number 10 as kingdoms. Right? Then the things become a symbol. Yeah, it becomes a symbol. It, it doesn't have to be literally understood as a number in this case. It, it, it does have a point as a number of 10 for the 10 tribes that come in and, and conquer Rome. But because three are, are plucked up and it's still considered 10, um, there's no reason that we have to say that the 10 horns in the Beast of Revelation 13 or even in the Beast of Revelation 12 are the same as the ten horns in the beast of Revelation 17. It's just a symbol of the kingdoms of the world at the end of the time that are going to uh, unite with the papacy and with the, the beast, right? Because the ten horns are going to then represent the dragon power, the United Nations. So these are all going to be united at the end of the world. So there's no reason this argument... To say that they must always be the same ten horns, it just doesn't really, it doesn't really fit. It's it's reading into something, uh, into these prophecies, something that's not there. Now I can see why people would assume that initially. Right? It's just like when we look at periods of seventy years, we just think they're all the same period of seventy years. Okay. So his next point, and, 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 and just notice that he says, and have our past expositions of this prophecy been all, all wrong? Now, he could have asked, are some of the, the details of our understanding of this prophecy, do they need to be further understood? And, and we could answer yes, but nobody's saying that the past expositions of this prophecy have been all wrong. I mean, we're not definitely saying that. We're just saying that there are, there are details that, that haven't been considered and that we need to consider them in the light of what's happening at the end of the world. When the Pope erects the 10 new provinces in Europe, then it is said his dominion is returned to him. So this is just a view that none of us hold. Um, um, but I, I want to read this anyway. So when the Pope erects the 10 new provinces in Europe, then it is said his dominion is returned to him. Um, and the deadly wound received in 1798 is healed. But it is not, but 
is not healed before. Then the seven give their power and strength to the beast one hour, which is taken as a prophetic period, meaning 15 days. If this is so, the angel of Revelation 10, 6 swore to a falsehood or to the views of that prophecy heretofore held are all wrong. He swore that time should be no longer, but it is not that time might not be spoken of in a prophetic sense as the days of the seventh angel, but that every prophetic period had expired and there was to be no more prophetic time in that sense. But lo, here comes up a definite prophetic period of 15 days. Now, of course, this is sort of immaterial to the argument. Just because somebody has put in one hour as being 15 days um, as something in the future has nothing to do with the argument that's being given. I mean, that, that would be just a side point. So he's picking at what he considers a flaw in this argument. Now, whether this one hour should be taken as a period of 15 days or not, right, really has nothing to do with the argument. But also, we understand that time still exists. So we don't take the position that you can't have time symbolized after October 22nd, 1844. What we do have is the end of the prophetic periods. Now, when is it declared that time is no longer in Revelation 10? When does the angel declare that? Does the angel declare it on October 22nd, 1844? Yes. Okay. Isn't it declared at the beginning of that period in 1798 when the book of Daniel is opened? And that it's pointing to the end of those prophetic periods as October 22nd, 1844. You yes, understand? Uh, it, well, yes. It's, it's uh, time is no longer as in prophetic time. The 22nd of October, 1844. Right, and, and specifically the prophetic periods, right? Yes. Okay, right. So it's not really saying, now Ellen White does say that there shall be no reckoning of the prophetic periods after 1844, right? So she's clear that that declaration by the angel that there should be time no longer, which is really Christ, um, uh, marks the end of the prophetic periods. That is, we shall not have another message based upon time. Right? That's what she says in uh, Seven Bible Commentary, in that, uh, that article where she talks about Revelation 10. So, so we've gone through that in other studies in detail. So we know that we are not going to be looking for any of the fulfillments of those prophecies in the future, or even a message that's based upon time in the sense of when Christ is going to return or any of the prom promises of uh, special significance, right? None of God's promises are, are tied to time. Now, we have time in this movement. That is, we can look back and measure the time. We can see events that have happened in the past, and we can recognize that there is a time structure to them. And God has shown us this. But we know that we cannot predict events in the future. That we don't have a message that hangs upon time. In the sense of, you know, it, it never worked, right? Predicting that when Christ was going to come did not prepare a people who were ready for Christ's coming. So, so the third angel's message does not hang on time. Yet people still try to keep setting dates. Okay. So anyway, he talks about this, this period of time. Um, okay. So um, such an idea must be abandoned or we must apply the message of the angel of Revelation 10 to this future time. But this would disarrange the messages of Revelation 14 concerning which the spirit of prophecy has warned us not to move a block or store a pin. And so we would agree. You can't put this angel saying there's time no longer as someplace in the future, other than where Ellen White 
and the understanding of the history of this movement has placed it, right, 1844. So we're never going to reapply that. Um, now, now, Parminder did, right? That's what he tried to do. He tried to say, well, they understood it in this way, but we can take all these things, we're in a different dispensation, and we can just reapply them in our time. And uh, this is what people with time setting do. But we haven't done that, right? Uh, what about the work of the two horn beast? It will be noticed that this beast has no work attributed to it till after the deadly wound of the first beast is healed. Now we would agree with that, right? He speaks as a dragon, but he could not do this without exercising the power of the first beast. And he must exercise such power before he could cause men to worship the first beast. But when worship is rendered to the beast, it is said of him that his deadly wound was healed. Again, the image that is caused to be made is to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, or whose deadly wound had been healed. Now mark the conclusion to which we are driven by the new view. Okay, so, so we agree with what he says there. Uh, at the beginning of the future 15 days of papal triumph, the deadly wound is healed at the close of the 15 days, right? So again, he's looking at some view which we don't hold to. So he's found some view that has some absurdities in it that he can easily exploit and say, well, we can't look at this view because it has these contradictions. But again, he's not considering these things. He's just finding the faults uh, that exist in some argument, some position. So he's going to address this period of anarchy. Um, um, so he says, uh, and we just got a few minutes here. A brother in the ministry, having seen advanced sheets of this view presented in this tract, writes that he considers some points new light, and he is glad to see the light shining along the old paths. But he says that when the light is new, the path is new too, and he fears it may turn us into ignis fatis. Now, um, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what that means because I don't know Latin. And only lead the inquirer into, inquirer into uh, dangerous bogs. So it looks like, I mean, I would think ignis has to do with fire. Um, and I'm not sure what fatis is. Um, anybody know what the Latin there means? Can look it up quickly. Uh, not that it's like it sometimes appears in the night over marshy ground. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, or a deceptive goal or hope. Right. Okay. So, so that makes sense. Okay. Just wanted to know. It's just out of curiosity. So these are the. So remaining wisp, a wisp, yeah. So, and that would be these will o' the wisps that you would see uh, when you're in a bog or something, and you see this light, and you go towards it, but it leads you into danger. Um, uh, it's definitely a, a Scottish idea or a Celtic idea. You, do you know anything about that at all? You know, in Ireland, you, that idea of bogs. Yeah, it's a bit of a controversial. I don't know whether it's real or not. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, it, it's an idea that it, it exists in, uh, I know, in Celtic mythology or, or folk legends and stuff, right? Um, anyway, so that's what he's saying. He says uh, that this person is saying, well, there's some new light and I'm, I'm considering it dangerous. There's still a worse aspect that may be presented, and that is when the new light makes it necessary to consider that that which has been hailed and cherished and rejoiced in as light in the past was, after all, only darkness. Now, do we say that about past light? Are we saying that this is darkness, what the pioneers believe? No, I hope not. <laughs> We actually think that when we have new light, it makes the old light shine brighter. That it makes, it shows the foundation was laid correctly. That just because there are details that they didn't notice because of the time that they lived in, 
doesn't mean they were all wrong. Just because they predicted Christ coming to be in 1844 and it didn't occur, we don't say that it was all darkness. But do we say they're all right about everything? They definitely weren't right about the timing of Christ's second in coming. In detail, in detail, no. Right. So that's all we are doing. And, and this is, I think, an important point dealing with new light. If the Adventist people have been, as we believe, a people called out of the providence, out by the providence of God, into new light, and we are walking in the light, new light ought not to reveal the past as darkness and oblige us to tear up and throw away any positions which have been held for years without question as well-established truth, but it ought only to make the evidence clearer and our position stronger, right? And that's the view that we take. But it doesn't mean that everything is correct in every detail in positions of the past, because then there would be new, no new light. A good illustration of this was when the light of the sanctuary dawned up us, up upon us in 1844, confirming the past and lighting up the future. So the examination of the present case compels the verdict that what is true is not new and what is new is not true, right? So this is exactly the illustration of why we can look at the pioneer view and see that there were aspects that they could not have understood in their time and that those things are unfolded to us later, but they come from the understanding of what the pioneers understood, right? That is, they become the natural progression that if the pioneers were in our day, they would see the light of what we're saying and they would see that this was just a progression, not a rejection of light. So, so anyway, we're going to end there and we will come back uh, to these things. Um, we're pretty much done with your I Smith's article. I'm, I'm going to read through the rest of it and see if there's any points. But so on Sunday, we're going to do a bit of a review um, of, of these things. I'm going to try to organize it a little bit so we can see all these points. And then next week, we're going to start drawing these on a line. So we're going to draw all these beasts on a line as individual beasts, that is 12, 13a, 13b, and 17. And then we're going to see how they all fit together on a bigger line. And, and I think that we're going to see a lot of things there uh, become more in focus as we do that. Any, any final clear. question? What's that? Be a lot clearer. clearer yeah. yeah. So I'm hoping that we can, by the end of next week, uh, finish up this, this uh, drawing out of the lines. Whether we're going to finish up this whole study or not, I don't know. Uh, we're probably going to have to come back the week after and sort of refocus back to what we started with, call and study and how different things uh, are affected and, and how we can sort of reconcile all of these, this light that's come to this movement. So I think probably two more weeks and then this study should be ended. That's my, my hope. But it could go on longer. You know, there might be things that we don't foresee. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, for the time here this morning. And um, we are thankful that you have given light uh, to this movement uh, that does not contradict the light of the past. Um, we know, Lord, that we need to be open to receive light. And we, we understand the need to protect uh, the truths that are, have been established, but these need to be seen also that you want to show us um, things that apply to us today, that we need light, fresh light for our feet. We know the light shines all along the path and that we have to walk in that advancing light. So we just ask that you can help each of us to do this. Be with each person. We pray for the studies coming up this weekend. And we just ask that um, your angels can watch over each one and have some trials that we face. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.